Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 598. Don't trust your lab's reference ranges. Part 2. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your host is Dr. Kathy Moffat, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging. Dr. Maupin is the author of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the award-winning book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of testosterone replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. Today, we are going to finish the conversation that we started last week about lab tests and how to interpret them and um, the difficulty that that lab tests provide to the patient who is not a doctor or a nurse. In general, we are trained to look at lab tests as numbers that are associated with a certain biologic state like fasting or a certain age or a certain sex. And so we interpret these tests not just based on numbers that are written on your lab sheet, but based on the situation of the patient. Even some of these are changed, some of the lab tests, normals that I have to write in are changed by the fact that you take thyroid medicine or you take estrogen. So I have to interpret it based on your current situation, which is something that is very difficult to do if you're not a medical person. However, I do want to show you some of the problems with how these lab tests are reported and what you should know about the difference between what's on the paper and what it means for you in particular. So let me give you an example. Um, Estradiol is an estrogen that is what I call in women, young women's estrogen, what I call in men, young men's estrogen. They have estrogen as well. So when you're looking at estrogen levels and you are are listed in the lab as a female, then we look for certain numbers. If you're a male, then we look for other numbers. Now, the problem with estradiol levels and the reference range, which from now on I'm going to say the reference range is what's listed on the lab test, but it indicates what is normal or looked for in terms of the ideal ideal blood level. But it is not always that. It is often not the right level for you. So here's my example. Um, Every woman who gets her blood who gets her blood drawn and gets an estradiol level actually has a number or a range of what is normal for her now if you are menopausal they don't always recognize that there may be an area for menopause a big range of what estrogen you might be but they're going to call you normal for estradiol, even if you have no estradiol at all, if you are over 40. Well, that may be average for people in menopause, but what if you're not menopausal and you're 40? That may be average for for people who are menopausal, but they have many symptoms of menopause, meaning they are not well. They have hot flashes, they have night sweats, they have a dry vagina, they have painful intercourse if their estradiol is low. So, in this particular test, the way they, the way they um, change the reference range for your age doesn't really seem appropriate. So I always have to write in what is healthy and normal for a woman or a man. So what is healthy and normal for a woman in estri- for estradiol is 60 to 250 picograms per deciliter. You don't know what those units mean. They're very tiny. Um, But that is what we have when we're young and cycling. We are healthiest before menopause. We are healthiest when we have all of the estrogen that our ovary makes with an ovulation. 
So if I'm looking at somebody who's menopausal and their level is low, I write, or, or zero, I write low needs to be replaced. And what I'm looking for after the next time I draw a lab is for their blood level to be in the range of somebody who is not in menopause. That's where we're healthiest. So that's how we look at it there. Say I was looking at estradiol for someone who is going through infertility and she doesn't ovulate every month, but her estrogen is within this range that they can, a huge range that they consider fertile or young. She's in that range, but she's too low to have made an egg. Your, your estradiol goes up to about 200 to 300 during ovulation on the day that I ordered it. So if I order it on day 12 or 13, a person who's trying to get pregnant who is not menopausal should spike her estradiol up to 200 to 300. That would mean that she is ovulating. So anything other than that for that particular purpose is not normal. I hope I'm making myself clear. I'm trying to say that every time you get a lab test, it has to be related to your age, your sex, and why we're doing the blood test. If I'm doing a blood test for people who are aging, I'm looking for menopause. If you're in menopause, then your estradiol is going to be lower than 60. If you're not in menopause, it'll be higher. So that's what I'm looking for. They don't necessarily put that down. They say, oh, you know, you're average for your age, you're postmenopausal if you're over 40. So if you've got nothing, that's okay. But I don't, but that is not healthy. So that's how I interpret uh, the estradiol for a woman. The other piece of the puzzle for menopause is FSH and LH. These are the two hormones that uh, go up and down during your cycle when you're young. But if you are menopausal, you have a low estradiol level, you're not taking hormones, and you come in with a high FSH, high LH, that gives me the diagnosis of menopause. You're definitely menopausal, low estrogen, high FSH, high LH. So when they see the high FSH and LH, they don't say abnormal or not healthy. They say, oh, that's within range because you're old, over than 40 or over, over 50. But nowhere in the data that you give to the lab do they tell you, if are you in menopause? They don't ask that question. They should, and then they should have their reference ranges keyed to that, but they don't. So it takes a doctor or a nurse practitioner to say to you, well, you don't have any estrogen, you have high FSH and LH, you're having hot flashes and night sweats, you're miserable, we're gonna give you estradiol, and what happens when we give you estradiol is that the FSH and LH then come back down to normal. FSH should be less than 23, LH less than 10, and when that happens and your estradiol is above 60, then your blood work looks like you're not menopausal anymore. You still are, but you don't have the symptoms of menopause. That's what I'm looking for. I'm trying to get you, get my patients back to young, healthy levels. And that's how I know. But the lab test won't tell you that. The lab test, when your FSH and LH come down, then they just say the same thing as when they're high, that's okay. That anything's okay after you're old. So that's why it's difficult for you to read your own labs, especially hormone labs. Hormone labs are really difficult because they change with age and they're quite different between the sexes. Um, free, free testosterone for women is another test where I have to write in what I consider normal in premenopausal women. That's where I'm trying to get you. That's what I'm comparing you to, not to somebody else who is your age. Say you're 60 and your free testosterone is two, well, that may be average for somebody who's 60, but it doesn't mean that you're healthy. It doesn't mean that compared to a young person, you have a lack of the symptoms of low testosterone. So if a, if a person is under 40, generally their free testosterone, if they're not on the pill or any other suppressants for the estrogen and testosterone, then like birth control pills, then your testosterone will be greater than seven nanograms per deciliter. So I'm looking 
on the initial blood work to look for your free testosterone to see if you need me to replace it. And if it's under seven, and it usually is after you're 50, but if it's under seven, then I need to replace it. I tie that together with your symptoms. It's not just, oh yeah, I'm gonna look at your lab and decide what to do with you. I have to look at your symptoms. If you have the symptoms of low testosterone, like um, low sex drive, inability to have orgasms, if your testosterone, um, low testosterone causes you to have insomnia, muscle mass that is, is going away, or um, you feel old, you have no motivation, you don't feel like going anywhere or doing anything, depression, anxiety, all of those things are signs of low testosterone. If you have more than seven, you're generally not gonna have any of those symptoms. But if you're below seven, the symptoms accompany the, um, that's my Minnie Mouse watch, which I didn't turn off, um, sorry. Uh, your symptoms will accompany uh, your blood work. So if you have a, anything less than seven, then you're going to have the symptoms of low testosterone in general. It's, it just reassures me. But what they say is, normal can be zero, by the way. No testosterone is considered zero. And no testosterone up to like 2.5, I believe, is the range that they consider a woman over 40 to have as normal. If everybody had that, they'd all be, we'd all be symptomatic. None of us would then be diagnosed as low testosterone, and therefore none of us would get treated. So I looked at this as looking at testosterone for women is very difficult in terms of lab. The lab process is difficult. So it's not like it's slam dunk, oh yeah, you can do this test just as easy as anything else. It's a difficult test to do. So that means it's not quite as accurate as some other tests. So we have to give it some wiggle room. But low testosterone is a, is a sign that you do need to have testosterone replaced if you want to be healthy. So we have to, I write in seven, greater than or equal to seven. That's my, that's my normal, what I'm looking for before treatment. After treatment, I'm looking for a blood level that is considered effective with pellets for women, not pellets for men, not every woman who's menopausal. I'm looking at a different normal. Pellets for women should, should leave a patient at three months before her next insertion, should give her a testosterone free of between um, 15 and 45. And I've even, I've even had people who require 50 to get rid of the symptoms because it's not just about your blood level, it's about your receptor sites. Are they working? Are some, are they, have they gone down in number? Are they less sensitive? You know, so it's not just about your blood level. So I look at both signs, symptoms, and blood tests. But in this case, I have a different range that I'm looking for for somebody who is menopausal versus somebody who's not menopausal but still has her own ovaries. And I have a different uh, range that I'm looking for in pellets to show that somebody has enough testosterone and that combined with their symptoms tell me what to do with their dose. Sounds pretty complicated, I guess. So um, total testosterone I don't order for women because it's very confusing. Um, most doctors don't know how to interpret it for women, so they interpret it like a woman is a man, and that's just, that's not appropriate. But total testosterone for men tells me this. If a man has a total testosterone that is over 400, then he is making testosterone. So that's one sign. Your lab test, your lab reference range is 200 to like 600 or something very low. And that, in general, if you're over 40, that's, they give you a very low range of what is normal for total testosterone. So when I'm looking at this, I have to also have the free testosterone. That's the testosterone that is actually working. So your body just sees the, the active form of testosterone, which is called free testosterone. It has nothing to do with money. It has to do with, it is not bound. It is free of binding. So free testosterone uh, for men 
should be 129 to about 300. Now that's what I'm looking for in men, either if they are being diagnosed, if they're less than that, that's they'll have symptoms. If they are being treated with testosterone, then I want them to be above 129 free testosterone. All the testosterone total tells me is um, that you have a good blood level of the, the uh, bound testosterone plus the free testosterone, but your body doesn't care. Your body can't use bound up testosterone. It can only use the free testosterone. So that's the most important test. If you have an 800 total testosterone, but your free testosterone is 50, that means that you have a lot of your testosterone bound up to a protein and it can't be used. So I still have to address that problem so that I can get more free testosterone for you. So that's, the total testosterone is, does he make testosterone? The free testosterone is, does he have enough to actually uh, have no symptoms from low testosterone like ED or um, fatigue or loss of libido? So that's how I look at uh, testosterone for men and for women. Um, another test that drops with age. So estrogen drops with age, testosterone drops with age. The, other, the next test that drops with age is called uh, IGF-1, but it measures your growth hormone, a, a hormone from your pituitary and from the hypothalamic axis. axis. Um, IGF-1 is the first metabolite of growth hormone. Growth hormone peaks at 4 a.m. You're not at the lab at 4 a.m., so we may miss it. It may be very low by 6 or 8 a.m. So we test the next, the next product of growth hormone as it's being broken down, which is IGF-1. That comes, in the, comes from the liver. Growth hormone for young, healthy men and women should be 150 to 350. That is people between 20 and 40, when they're not growing anymore, yet they are young, healthy, they have good muscle mass, they are lean. Uh, if you're 150 to 350, then you're usually somebody who exercises, somebody who eats properly, somebody who doesn't, isn't obese, somebody who isn't um, abusing sugar or alcohol, because all of those things make your growth hormone go down. So when I look at this before someone has had testosterone, I look at it to see basically the state of leanness of their body, but I can tell that by looking at them and with my comp a body composition machine. But I also look at it to see if testosterone is, the low testosterone has stopped stimulating growth hormone because normally growth hormone comes from the uh, brain, the pituitary and hypothalamus. Testosterone is stimulated comes from the testicle and comes from the ovary, but it's stimulated by a pituitary hormone as well. So when you have a good testosterone level, generally that helps with your growth hormone level too. So if I look at this and they have a low IGF-1, then either they may have had a head injury or they're old or they are not lean. And they usually have low testosterone. After testosterone, I usually see the growth hormone go up. People get leaner. People have a health age of lower than before they started taking their testosterone. So the growth hormone actually goes up. So generally about, women are usually about 30 points higher after the first dose of testosterone. Men can go up high, even higher than that after the first dose. Uh, so that's one of the ways I look at whether the testosterone's working. But I'm also looking at, is the pituitary working? Did this person have a head injury? In the case of head injuries, your testosterone may be working great, but your growth hormone will remain low. So that's another sign to me as the doctor that you have some other issue that is suppressing your ability to become lean and to make muscle and to heal well. That's all, those are all the things that growth hormone do in adults, or growth hormone does in adults. So. Growth hormone is one of the things that I look at in the beginning and compare to after we give you testosterone. There's one caveat to this, this rule, and that is if my patient comes back and is 30 pounds lighter than she was when we started, 
then growth hormone will go down before it goes back up because you can't grow and lose weight or shrink at the same time. So growth hormone always drops as people are losing weight and then comes back up. So I just wait and test it at a year to see what their um, diet and their exercise and all the things I ask them to do, plus their testosterone pellets have done for them. So it's not always a sign if your, test, if your growth hormone goes down that you have a head injury, but I do test for that and look for that. It's all about what's in your brain and what you're looking for and what the normals are. The normals they give for growth hormone, they give a normal that is adjusted for your age. So if you look around at the people your age, you'll see a lot of people who are overweight, unwell, smoking, drinking, all kinds of things that if you want to be healthy, you're not doing. So that is not a good test. That's like saying to people who have um, osteoporosis, people with thin bones, I'm going to compare you to somebody who's your age. Well, if you're 70 and you don't take estrogen, then you're going to have osteoporosis, especially if you're a female. If you are actually um, compared to young, healthy people, then we will look at your bones compared to a 29-year-old female, and we'll find out that you have osteoporosis. It's not about, medicine is not about comparing you to averages when it comes to blood tests that decrease with age. It's about comparing you to young, healthy, normal. And that's the one thing you need to take from this. But the labs don't show young, healthy, normal. They show average for your age, and sometimes they don't even take into account your, uh, your sex. Um, one other test that I want to go over, and that is uh, thyroid. Thyroid tests in the last 20 years since I've been doing um, preventive medicine and treating patients with testosterone, I always take care of their thyroid if their thyroid is off. Uh, if you live in an area with low iodine content in the water and the, and the ground, you probably are at high risk for having um, low thyroid because iodine is needed for uh, the production of thyroid hormone. So when I, I look very carefully, we live in the, in the, not the Bible Belt, but the goiter belt. The goiter belt is the Midwest, basically, all the way up to the Rockies. And uh, we don't have iodine in our um, water or, or ground, so therefore our food. So when I look at my patients, I want to compare them to the range that is healthy. Well, it turns out that for the last 10 years, the normal range that is given in the reference range has been going down. It's been decreased so that someday I, I'm going to find out that you don't even need thyroid because it's going to be considered zero as normal. It used to be that your, um, your free T3, which is the most important thyroid hormone, used to be the range was 3 to 4.5. Now... It's different in every lab, but most labs, it's all the way down to 2.3, they consider normal. So when you do this with a lab test, I ask why. Why, is it keep, why does it keep going down? But more importantly, you're not treating all those people between 2.3 and 3 that should have been treated because they've got the symptoms of low thyroid and they really have low thyroid but the lab has made it made the doctors comfy in not doing anything. It works for doctors who don't want to replace thyroid and don't want to deal with that. It doesn't work for the rest of us who want to make you healthier. You need your thyroid to live. If it's not working right, you're going to gain weight, be swollen, have a high cholesterol. You're going to be treated with a lot of other drugs for fatigue and weight gain, you uh, and swelling. You're going to have um, you're going to be depressed. Your hair's going to fall out. Your skin is dry. And you're going to be told your thyroid's normal. Well, it's not normal. It's just in this range that they have lulled us into believing is normal. Now, how did they do this? Why did they do this? Normally, uh, th thyroid or any other blood test, uh, the way we get our ranges or our reference ranges, is by testing young, healthy people, a big group of them who sign up for a medical study. 
and we test their thyroid and ask them the questions, do they have symptoms of low thyroid? If they do, then we send them out and we just test people who are young, healthy, and without symptoms for low thyroid. When we do that, we, div we then get a range, and that's how the range that was 3 to 4.5 15 to 20 years ago was, was created. Now, for some reason, I don't know who's motivating this, but the lab every year lowers that lower number. It keeps going lower. Why? Because they are testing, taking their, <laughs> taking their group of people to test out of you and me who may have be sick when they come in to get lab drawn. We may be on thyroid medicine. We may be on an anti-thyroid medicine. We could have uh, any number of diseases that cause thyroid to drop. They don't look at any of that. They just throw all those in a, in a uh, pot and decide on a bell curve of what's normal for this group of people. Well, people who go to the lab and get their blood drawn are not necessarily healthy. In fact, they're usually older, they're usually unhealthy, and they're usually sick. So now we are getting the range to compare people to. Instead of being healthy young people, we're getting the range, uh, people, we're making the range from people who are sick, older, and maybe on medication that shuts down your thyroid. Well, that's not any way to do medicine. And the labs have been doing this over and over and over for the last, I don't know how many years when I finally figured out that it kept the lower number kept getting lower. So I've been watching it, and it, every year they drop it a point, or excuse me, a point one, at least. So same for T4. T4 used to be um, 1 to 2.5 was normal. Now it's down to... It was originally, they dropped it to 0.9, now it's 0.8. And when we asked Quest, I asked Quest several times why this was happening. Um, I never got an answer from anybody, but my daughter, who Dr. Sullivan, who is much better at getting answers out of people, uh, finally wore them down and they said, we're just taking the numbers that we get in our lab that we draw the blood work for and we're just get, making a normal, a normal range out of it. Well, that's not scientific. And it's not good medicine. And all, the, and all the labs are doing that. And some labs, are, you know, it's down to 2.0 is considered normal. What that does is it keeps you from being treated for low thyroid. Even when you have it, it will not be acknowledged because the numbers have expanded south, basically, so that you're considered normal even if you're symptomatic. So this is... This is why you can't just look at your lab tests and say, I'm fine. Because I've had people do that. They'd get their tests back before they'd see me, and they'd call up and cancel because their lab tests said she, they were fine. Well, you know, their T3, their free T3 was, um, let's see, what did they drop it down to? So it was like 2.1. Well, they, that's low thyroid. And their T4 was 0.8, but the lab said it was fine. It was normal, or what they consider normal, the reference range. So in, in the blood tests that I was trained with for over 40 years ago, um, CBC and the um, metabolic panel, which is your kidneys, your liver, and your blood sugar, all of those numbers have been the same. What we compare our patients to is the same as what I trained with over 40 years ago. What made us healthy 40 years ago, or what blood levels of things made us healthy versus unhealthy, is the same as it was then. Human beings have not evolved in the, in the last 40 years, so we haven't changed. We shouldn't have numbers that do not represent health. All the numbers on your lab tests under reference range should say healthy normals or young healthy normals, but they don't. So be careful about reading your own lab and making assumptions from it because it's very difficult to read and you have to know all these caveats and different things that have been going on with lab tests in the recent past for you to actually understand whether you're normal or you need care. So this is, this is a uh, watch out for yourself kind of thing, but we do this for our patients. We just ask that they not interpret them themselves before they come in and see us and we go through every lab test and tell them what it means for them. So, I hope that helps you in your own care, or the care of a loved one that, you're, that you are um, participating in. And um, 
I love being here, so I will be back next week, and we will talk about something completely different. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BioBalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BioBalanceHealth.